morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. We're going to have a conversation together. It's a, a great topic, you know, in terms of very open-ended. It gives me a chance to just kind of go over really whatever I want for the next uh, three hours. Yeah. <laughs> but this is a great conference. I really look forward to it every year. It's a fun time to interact with all of you and and uh, hear your stories. And your stories are all very different, and we, we need to hear those to get a better understanding of this disease. And that's why we're here and why we uh, want to try to push this field forward you know, any way we can. Um, although if you look at the literature in terms of what's new, you know, it, it's tough. You know, this is a field that you know, there's not a whole lot of literature new every month, like other fields that are moving very quickly. This field is still pretty slow in terms of the number of people really dedicated for this disease, the, the amount of funding dedicated to Chiari is, is uh, you know, small in comparison to many other fields. So um, I thought it would be fun, at least for me, you can hopefully you'll stay awake, but uh, just to review, you know, there's a certain topics that come up over and over that, that interest me and hopefully they interest you as well. And this is kind of evolving what's, what's new or what's hot, you know, in this field of where it's going. We always talk about the natural history. You know, we don't, under, don't understand this. Um, what's different of a symptomatic Chiari or syrinx versus an adult or child who's asymptomatic? You know, we see so many kids, the pediatric neurosurgeons here and neurologists, of kids with syrinxes which have no symptoms, you know, picked up incidentally. We see many, many Chiaris, more and more now, because of how much easier it is to get an MRI scan you know, scan for some other condition found to have a Chiari. You know, what do we do with that? How do we counsel them? You know, and a lot would say, well, if I need the surgery anyway, let's get it done. Let's get it over with. My insurance is going to run out, this or that. You know, a lot of good reasons it may sound like, but we can't be sure they're ever going to need surgery. You know, especially kids or adults that may have no symptoms at all that we can clearly relate to Chiaris. The natural history is something that we're beginning to understand as we look at these cohorts of people that are followed with symptoms and without. But this is very biased, you know, because those with symptoms often will get surgery, right? Not a lot of people are sitting on these tight Chiari malformations and, and not operating on them if they have symptoms, uh, adults or kids. So it's the asymptomatic kids that we have a lot more of a handle of what happens over time. And it's a very benign natural history, it seems, and what's published. Sports is something that has interested me for a long time and in terms of can our patients go back and play sports with or without surgery? You know, we, we can take a poll here, but I'm sure we get a difference of opinion. Um, cognitive effects, you know, this is a topic that's, I, I think, fascinating in that we see these patients with a lot of cognitive symptoms. And anatomically, how do we account for that? Memory loss in a Chiari patient, you know, how do you develop memory loss? Um, reaction times, uh, motor executive function, all these different functions that were so good in a concussion, you know, we talk about post-concussive symptoms, but in Chiari, it, it's hard to think about these pathways of how something relates of a, the tonsils in the back of the brain, how that relates to memory and pr providing those links and are we getting better at that? DTI imaging, you know, this is this diffusion tensor imaging, really fancy, beautiful pictures you can see to look at the white matter tracks in the brain. And just coming online as some of these studies with Chiari that we really had no handle on before. So I think that's fascinating in terms of what's coming. We can't get past this duraplasty versus no duraplasty. You know, do we patch, do we not patch? And do we use ultrasound? And a lot of, uh, new things there because of the use of intraoperative MRI now with some of these Chiari patients in terms of in the operative operating room and doing an MRI while they're asleep after the bony decompression to make these decisions to open the dura. You know, a lot of questions come up there in terms of what's the right thing. Um, and sleep apnea. This one bothers me a lot because there's several kids that I've operated on for sleep apnea, you know, in a Chiari. Some get better, some don't. You know, we don't have a good handle on that. And it's very frustrating when they don't. 
And it's hard to tell a family up front how much will this improve things, how much won't. And you had a talk on sleep. I'm not going to go too much in detail on that. But this is becoming a hotter topic because we're finally getting some data. You know, we're doing sleep studies before and after Chiari. We involve our sleep experts routinely in these patients. And this is not unique just to Chiari. It's true in the concussion field. And I keep mentioning concussion because I have a lot of parallels from my time in the Air Force that, that come out that, you know, is actually a lot of common links. So we'll go through some of these topics for the next six hours. Six hours now? This might take a little longer. Than, um, tonsil position has been a really interesting topic. Uh, Cormac, who couldn't, couldn't be here, it was a big study. Over 2,000 patients were in this Ann Arbor database. They've collected, looking back at these MRI scans that are done, you know, these are not symptomatic patients. These are just the normal, say, normal population of people that have got scans um, and looking at their tonsil position, cerebellar tonsil in the back of the brain. You know, it's fascinating what they, what they find in terms of females have a lower tonsil position than males. Theoretically, you'd pick up Chiari malformations more commonly than in women, right? Just statistically, because their tonsils are lower if you look at a population of 2,000 people. I mean, that's a fascinating fact that just we haven't really thought about before. The right tonsil is lower than the left. Well, who cares about that? We have no idea what that means. Um, but they're often, and the neurosurgeons here know that, you know, the tonsils are not usually just sitting equal in terms of their height. You know, there's, there's a length difference from one side to the other, but we don't know what that means. Um, but there's different age groups, and if you look at tonsil position, this is, over age, sorry, I don't know if you can, are you seeing anything? No. Sorry, do you see anything there? I don't see it, sorry. <laughs> well, this is looking over age and you can, as you go up in age, you know, the tonsils will go lower and lower. You can see this dip which happens at a pretty young age, and this is what we know in that between the age of one and five, say, these tonsils actually can go up, meaning up toward normal. And we see Chiari's reverse at that young age, particularly the asymptomatic kids. I think that's the key fact, asymptomatic. These kids will reverse and their tonsils will, will go up versus then older, you're gonna just, they get lower and lower. And again, women lower than, than men. But, these fascinating natural history or studies over time looking at age, I think are really, really interesting and something we should pay attention to, again, to help with our definition of, of what is this disease and how we're going to define it because of what's so common in the population. On to sports. You know, so this was a common scenario that I faced in the Air Force. This was an F-16 pilot. They can't stand getting MRI scans because it's gonna show something they don't expect that could knock them out of being a pilot, right? So this, this uh, flyer had just some radicular pain in the C6 distribution down his arm, thought to have a disc. Well, it didn't show a cervical disc, it showed a pretty impressive QR malformation. So now what? Well, his, by the time he saw me, of course, his disc symptoms got better. He no longer had arm pain, which is pretty classic of this story. But he has a very tight Chiari. So who's going to let this wire eject out of an F-16 with this? Well, you know, it's a no-brainer, right? Of course not. Well, it becomes more complicated than that when the Department of Defense comes after you saying, you've got to be kidding. You're going to take this ACE flyer out of the field. He's asymptomatic. What's the data show? Well, we have no data. And this is where we really had a problem that we wrestled with. Of what's, what's the right answer? Of course, I'm worried they're going to come after me because their plane just went down, you know, how many billions of dollars. But we've got to protect the flyer. And there clearly could be a risk, right, of this gentleman ejecting from an F-16. But it's no different in sports, you know, and how are we going to handle that? There's lots of considerations of, you know, is a Chiari a true contraindication to sports? It doesn't matter if they have symptoms or not. You know, and I would say it, it does. You know, clearly if they're symptomatic before, we're not going to let them go back and at that point and play sports. You may after surgery. Um, if they have a syrinx, I'm more worried, right? Even more concerned that a ding or something on the 
contact sport could make them much higher risk for a problem. Just like a child with hydrocephalus with a concussion. I mean, there's, there's a vulnerability there based on what they have that ups the ante. Is there data for this? We'll, we'll know. Um, but there's, there's some papers coming out. This is the most recent. And all these papers are within the last year, which I'm highlighting. And what is the risk to the athlete for catastrophic injuries? Well, these are pretty serious injuries we're talking about. Death, paralysis. And in 150, almost 150 athletes they looked at, some contact sports, some not, 0% had a catastrophic injury. So it's probably pretty low. Is this enough data to say, well, get, get everyone back into sports? Well, no, we're still gonna be worried and have to address this on a case-by-case -case basis, but this kind of work excites me. At least we're starting to talk about this and get this out there that, at least for a kid, you know, can we get them back to sports? You know, my goal is to try to get these kids to lead as normal life as we can. You know, I really want to get them back into what they love to do. But is it contact football, rugby, ice hockey, boxing? You know, that, that's the real question. And they're going to come to you with these, these questions as they do every day now. But this is a neat study that, that is coming along. Cognitive effects is, is also fascinating. This Mark Luciano and his group um, had a really interesting paper looking at uh, reaction time, working memory, and we didn't used to talk about this, you know, but this is something that now prospectively, before and after surgery, we can look at some of these cognitive effects of Chiari and how complicated this disease is. And the big question, of course, is does it relate to structure? Is there something on the picture that will show you something that you, know, you can predict this patient will have problems in certain areas? And, it's coming, you know, we're starting to at least gather the data that we didn't use to before. But these kind of papers, I think, are critical to look at what's the comorbidity of this disease and before surgery, after surgery. We can't change the bias of who got operated on. That, that varies all over the, the world. But if we have a better handle on maybe who gets better and what gets better, I think we can do better on how we counsel patients uh, for surgery. Um, and it's studies like this that I talked about, these DTI diffusion tensor imaging, where we look at all these different tracks, all these color coding tracks that they're trying to make predictions of, well, if this tract had more disorganized white matter, does that mean they're gonna have more deficits or are they gonna do better from surgery? The holy grail is really trying to, for a surgeon is picking out, we don't wanna operate on people that are not gonna benefit, right, from this type of operation. Is this another clue, looking at their white matter tracks and, and following their fibers? And the data is, is quite fascinating looking at it, you know, in that they can now start looking at symptomatic versus asymptomatic and predict that based on their white matter tracks. I mean, that, that's really exciting, I think. And that, that's what's coming in our ability to image these patients get better and better. This kind of imaging is part of our standard MRIs now. This is no special bells and whistles but it takes a big team to post-process these and start interpreting them. Um, and that's what we need more of, I think, in this field. Uh, but that, that's exciting, of that there's differences that we pick up, say, in axonal health. Another biomarker is really imaging. And this is way beyond just the length of your tonsil, right? This is much more detailed about how these fibers are connected to other parts of the brain. Because, again, we have an interest in these other effects of Chiari, the cognitive side, the memory, reaction time, attention. And attention seems to be the biggest one that has come out of this. There are some others that came out, but if you take out depression and chronic pain, they went away. So that, that's a problem too. Those comorbidities will change your imaging also. But attention was the only one that kept coming out that was significant that there's a change in the attention, ability of someone to be attentive to a certain task and ignore the stuff that you don't want to pay attention to right now, like me. You know, you can get away with that. But if you, if you could be more attentive, that was picked up in some of this imaging. And now you can have a flow diagram of, you have compression and you have nonspecific, indirect changes that, you know, we don't understand why these changes are there but there's a difference of what we pick up on imaging 
and the person that, that we're trying to protect either with or without surgery. And you know, the chronic pain, the fatigue, the anxiety, depression, all these contribute to changes as well. We have to think about those. But that's how this field has advanced. I think even the papers about cognitive decline, it's helpful because it, it can put this in context that we can't ignore it. So I really like this paper because it, it thought about these other comorbidities up front. Now there's lots of different things coming out about opening the dura and not opening the dura and this controversy. I'm not going to go too much in detail except that you know, we have to be so specific now as a surgeon of what we found at the time of surgery, particularly this fibrous band that we find that we think is significant, the C1 arch, the back of the skull. Um, this is a complicated topic and this was a paper that's very recent came out of MUSC um, that looked at a single center experience and that if they didn't open the dura, 32% required or had recurrent symptoms. That's a high number, a third. But you have to look into this carefully. Did they use ultrasound to, tell the, to decide to open the dura? They did not routinely. So we, we have to think about, well, what we're doing if we're not opening the dura we probably go another step and do the ultrasound and determine if we need to do that. And some centers now are using the intraoperative MRI scanner, which creates a long surgery. You're going to be asleep for maybe six, eight hours, but you can at least do these different images at time points to make that determination. Why do we care? Well, opening the dura, we clearly know is associated with more CSF spinal fluid complications. So it matters. If we can get the same result with less risk, it's better, you know, for the patient. Um, so there's, there's a few papers coming out that, that highlight this in the last year. Um, depending whether they have a syrinx or not, and this last paper this year didn't seem to matter whether you open the dura or not. Actually, the syrinx response was better in the patients that they didn't open the dura. So this is a, a complicated topic, but what worries me is the 30% recurrence. If we just say, oh, don't open the dura, take the bone off, we need to follow that up with something more. We gotta get that number down if we're not gonna open the dura. And lastly, this whole sleep apnea question. You know, you know, sleep apnea is complicated, right? There's central apnea, which is really what we're talking about, and there's obstructive apnea that the ear, nose, and throat docs often see more than we do. Um, but a very high prevalence if we look at it much more common than, than we've thought before. And based on the concussion kids that we see that have a terrible abnormal sleep pattern and have symptoms throughout the day that you know, are really dramatic, and if we improve their sleep, a lot of these daytime symptoms get better. You know, there's something there that we don't understand, but I think we have to apply that same to Chiari. If there's a sleep problem here, we need to investigate that up front you know, before we operate on this patient to get a better handle of their symptoms. So we tried to really involve our sleep experts as much as we can now in these patients. Uh, you know, we find quite a bit up front that we didn't expect. In this series, you know, they're 40 percent, you know, in terms of documented objective sleep problems. That's a very high rate, you know, for someone that you wouldn't normally even refer to a sleep expert. I think what's interesting is if you look in the literature, there's improvement with Diamox. But this is in the sleep literature. This is not the Chiari literature. We talk about Diamox a lot with pseudotumor and CSF production. Diamox also can improve the apnea, you know, for sleep patients. So not related, they think, to what's going on so much in the brain. It's more of a chemoreceptor carbon dioxide uh, change with the metabolic acidosis. So there's parallels here. I think we can really learn from these sleep experts and we need to involve them in this meeting. And the most recent paper this year is some MRI findings that are trying to look at, again, imaging to pinpoint what is unique about that imaging in the kids or adults um, that have sleep apnea, central sleep apnea. And that would be, be great to try to pick that up you know, in advance. And the Holy Grail is this paper that just, just came out, um, I think in neurosurgery, which looks at the whole thing. And 
we need many, many more papers like this. Because right now we have groups doing this and this and this. But this is a great paper, I think, that looks at everything. It looks at symptoms. It looks at the volume of the posterior fossa, okay? How big is the cranial vault back there where the cerebellum is? It looks at flow dynamics of the CSF flow in the back of the brain. But to connect all these with symptoms, the only thing they didn't look at is the imaging like I described, these fancy white matter tracks. But I think this is a great start because look at all these variables now that we can get in a single patient. If you look at spinal flow measures, uh, all these different lines we draw for deciding about the volume, uh, CSF flow, and uh, blood flow changes. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of data that we could be getting on everyone. And how to put this all in context together, I think, is really going to be the advance that we can provide for this field that would be very beneficial. This is all meaningless unless we have a definition of what we're looking at, looking at, right? And even this morning at our board meeting, you know, we talked a lot about we need to better define this, this definition of Chiari. And it's way beyond tonsils are down five millimeters. That, as you know, is, is just the, the first step in, in how we can define this as a field. And this is where we need your input, you know, as the patient, as, as those experiencing these symptoms, because we don't want to leave you out you know, in this, uh, as we move forward. Um, and there's some really great imaging now we can get in 3D. And then as we look over time at, at the velocity of the tonsils coming up and down, I mean, the physics involved is, is just fantastic of what they could bring to this field. Um, so think about all the specialists we need that we've talked about, you know, in these papers, you know, sports trainers, headache specialists, sleep experts, neuropsychologists with all the cognitive symptoms. Phys physicists, MR specialists, and neuroradiologists. This is a very complicated field. So I think I'll stop there, and we can talk in the panel later about any questions you might have. But I think this is exciting of what's coming to the field. It, it's really gathering the players all together in the one room, which is what's happened in the traumatic brain injury field. Um, and I think it, this is what we need right now you know, for Chiari. So thank you for your attention.